Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Muriel Bowser. I'm the mayor of Washington, D.C., and I am standing in beautiful Ward 6 in the heart of Washington, uh, where uh, about, I guess, about 85, 90,000 people live. Uh, part of the 712,000 people who live and work uh, and raise families and pay their taxes in Washington, D.C. I'm joined today by members of my administration, Robert Conti, the chief of the Metropolitan Police Department, Chris Rodriguez, director of the district's Homeland Security Agency, and Dr. Roger Mitchell, the deputy mayor for public safety and justice. I'm also joined by uh, John Felciccio, the deputy mayor for planning and economic development, and Elliot Ferguson, who is the direct, who is the CEO and president of Destination DC. I'm also joined today by members of the Council of the District of Columbia, Charles Allen, uh, who is our host council member, the council member for Ward 6, and council member Brooke Pinto, the council member for Ward 2. Uh, I wanna just uh, have a quick check-in with everyone uh, ahead of tomorrow's historic inauguration. And, um, we also want to talk about uh, what, what's in the future for a beautiful city. And that's why I asked uh, Elliot Ferguson to join us here today uh, because he spends every day thinking about our destination and why people want to come visit Washington, D.C. We are just 24 hours away from welcoming President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Let's give them a big round of applause. And I know many people are disappointed as I am uh, that we, we have to enjoy the inauguration. We've asked our fellow Americans to join the inauguration uh, from home and watch the wonderful virtual events that the president's the vice president, uh, the president elect's inauguration committee has planned. We know certainly that there is a lot to celebrate and we know that people are excited to begin this new chapter. But for the health and safety of our country, people are making the right choice to stay at home and watch the events virtually. Here in Washington, D.C., we've made a lot of friends around the country this past year. We felt the support of Americans nationwide on a number of occasions. We know that today more people than ever before have joined us in our fight for DC statehood. More people than ever before understand the injustice of disenfranchising 712,000 taxpaying Americans. They understand too why it needs to be fixed and why it needs to be fixed now. And they get that the only way to ensure that Washingtonians have full access to our democracy is through statehood. So to our friends across the country, thank you for your support. And my hope is that you will join us in pushing for it. And it is also my hope that you will join us right here in Washington, D.C. Uh, to celebrate. Uh, and we hope that our new president and new vice president will rethink some of the events that are traditional for this time of year, like a parade, like balls and celebrations, like parties at uh, various homes across the District of Columbia, at our restaurants. We hope that you and they will come back to Washington, D.C. Uh, to celebrate the 4th of July and celebrate Labor Day. And we will be able to have somewhat different, but still celebrations of our new administration. What do you think about that idea? We have been through a lot together in this country. And while we've had some dark days over the past year, We've also witnessed how resilient we are as a people. Americans still deserve to celebrate the incoming administration as well as the enduring spirit of our democracy. 
We, of course, also welcome the opportunity to show our fellow Americans the 63 square miles that lie outside the security perimeter that they're seeing on the news. We want people to see our neighborhoods where we raise our families, where we have parks and playgrounds and parades and festivals, where we have world-class restaurants, theaters, and music venues. We want Americans to see the real D.C., the neighborhoods like the one we're standing in right now. Yes, in the shadow of the Capitol, but all Washington, D.C. Yesterday, I was also heartened to see Washingtonians posting photos of their neighborhoods on social media and tagging them with We Are D.C. It is a much needed reminder to the world that our city has so much to offer outside of the federal enclave. And actually, all of these neighborhoods are what will become the 51st state of Washington, D.C. So keep sharing those photos. Make sure that you're signed up for inauguration alerts. Remember that if you see something unusual, say something. And I'm glad that you've been doing that over the last several days and our agencies have been following up on every last concern. The eyes of the world are on D.C. right now, and we're going to continue to show everyone why Washington, D.C. is the greatest city in the world and soon to be the 51st state. So please join me in welcoming uh, your council member, Charles Allen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. My name is Charles Allen. I'm the Ward 6 council member. And two, two quick things I want to talk about today. One is I do want to reassure all of our neighbors and D.C. residents about the steps being taken. Um, I'm on almost a regular contact with Chief Conti, Chief Donnelly from the Fire Department, with Director Rodriguez from HSEMA, Dr. Mitchell, and of course our mayor. And I'm feeling confident about the steps our city is taking to make sure that at the end of the day we're keeping our residents and keeping our city safe. There's a lot of things that we may not be able to control for, but for the things that we are, I've been impressed with the way in which our city has mobilized and is working hard, and I want residents to know that. Now, of course, in Ward 6, we are no stranger to the federal capital complex. They may be pictures and symbols of American democracy to the rest of the country, but for us, they're in our backyard. Um, you know, there's a tree in the Supreme Court that my daughter likes to read a book under. These are places that are a part of our vibrant community. And so we, we feel a little bit of a way when we see it under assault. Um, and it's something that we know we feel very strongly about. What we know, of course, as the mayor's talked about, is that we deserve to have a voice in the halls of that building more so than ever. And the fight for DC statehood could not be stronger and more important and more necessary right now than at any other time, I think, in our country's history. In addition to that, of course, as the mayor said, we're in the middle of a neighborhood. This weekend I swung by, Easter Market was alive. It was full of people and residents doing their business, artists and vendors selling their, their wares, and part of just an exciting and vibrant community. So we want to make sure that residents know to be able to get out, to be able to help support their local businesses, to help make sure our community is alive and vibrant. And we know that as we get through the next several days and then we start the, the unwinding of what we have seen, we know our communities are going to be strong and we know that we want people to be out supporting our businesses and all the great things that our community has to offer. So thank you, Ms. Mayor, for the hard work that's going into this to be successful tomorrow. Uh, and I'm proud of, of what's going to take place and proud of the way that our city is really pulling together. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, and thanks for all the great work you're doing. I think uh, in the course of the, um, our COVID modified operations, we've opened some new playgrounds and have even more interesting things for Ward 6 neighbors to enjoy, and we're going to keep on doing that. Uh, we also wanted to invite Council Member Pinto, whose Ward, Ward 2, encompasses a good part of the affected areas uh, around the White House and the National Mall. Council Member Pinto. Thank you. I'm Brooke Pinto, Council Member representing Ward 2 on the DC Council. I want to thank Mayor Bowser and Chief Conti for your leadership during these extraordinarily challenging times um, and echo the sentiment of during this week to stay home, watch the inauguration virtually. I know that we can get through this time together. 
Um, Ward 2 encompasses much of the downtown area and the federal buildings that are affected by the closures. And I'm so grateful to the resiliency of our community for our businesses, folks like Mike Brand at the Penn Quarter Sports Tavern and Jose Andres who have fed thousands of our troops um, during, during this time with meals. And our residents who have opened up their backyard to ensure that we have a safe, peaceful transition of power. I think as has been mentioned, this time has shown our country how indicative and clear it is that we need statehood for the District of Columbia. <laughs> so we are looking forward to welcoming President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris to our city. Um, and I'm so grateful that they have called on all of us to guide us, to call on our better angels and restore civility and the norms that make our democracy so great. Thank you. And thanks for mentioning our great restaurants who are feeding troops now. We've been joined by Chef Spike Mendelson. Let's give Chef Spike a big round of applause. Yay. Chef Spike also got looped into chairing our Food Policy Council, and he's putting um, those policies into action. So thank you, Chef Spike. Um, I um, also, I mentioned Elliot Ferguson earlier, and I, I have to say it's an, an unusual position as a mayor to be in to invite people not to come to your city right now. Um, and it's not something that I would say lightly uh, at all. Uh, but I want everybody to know, all of our visitors, hotels, restaurants, and everybody who loves Washington uh, like we do, to know that Destination DC is planning right now to make your next trip your most special trip. Elliot, please come up. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I could not have put it better myself in terms of uh, how amazing Washington, D.C. is as a destination. You know, I've been lived in Washington for 19 years. I moved here right after 9-11. So I've dealt with and promoted Washington through a lot of instances where, as perhaps the global community might say, well, maybe I won't come to Washington because of something that's happening in the city, such as 9-11 and, and all the other things we've dealt with. I think right now the mayor's message is on point. We've got to focus on safety with the pandemic. We have to focus on, of course, having a safe day tomorrow. So even though the message is tied to not coming to Washington right now, there are reasons why we want to make sure that individuals understand the importance of coming back to Washington as a destination. One thing for sure, we know that every four years, we normally see an economic impact of a billion dollars tied to individuals coming to Washington, D.C. for the inauguration. And that's not going to happen this year. We're happy that we've got the 25,000 troops in the city to make sure that we're safe. And we love for the fact that people come to Washington to exercise their First Amendment right. As a matter of fact, protest tourism, safe protest tourism is something in which we're focusing on, thanks to the mayor, Black Lives Matter Plaza, and all the other things that are, are tied to our city. Uh, Washington is a great destination. Economic development tied to tourism is extremely important. As we look at the 80,000 people that work in this industry, the $8 billion that are generated on an annual basis, nearly $900 million in taxes that as a Washington resident, we all have a chance to benefit from. I have the pleasure of living in uh, the ward that we're in now, just a few blocks from here. And I moved here simply because I enjoy Ward 6 and Capitol Hill. It's a great destination. And it's a reason why we want individuals to want to come to Washington on a regular basis. Now, monuments, memorials, and museums and the federal experience, as the mayor referenced, is only a part of the reason as to why we want folks to visit. Our neighborhoods are amazing. The history, the, the architecture, uh, as the mayor referenced, all the events and activities, sporting events, nightlife, our great restaurants that were referenced earlier. These are the things that we promote on a regular basis. So at the proper time, because we still have to focus on a pandemic that's affecting the international uh, industry, we will be focusing on bringing folks back to Washington. We know that over 50 million people live within 250 miles of Washington, D.C. So we're gonna focus on all those amazing things that Councilmember Pinto referenced in Ward 2. 
but we're also going to talk about all the ways in which you can enjoy Washington and still socially distance by visiting our neighborhoods and how safe Washington is, uh, even though the perception might be of concern to those that are looking. So as the mayor referenced, our goal is to get back out there with our four international offices and our amazing team here working with Events DC, the Hotel Association and the Restaurant Association, and of course our mayor to promote Washington DC as a world-class destination. So stay tuned as we do that very soon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Thank you. All right, we'll take some questions. Question, Sam. bridges that the inbound bridges that would be closed and those that we understand Metropolitan Police put out. Can we get some explanation there please? Sure. Um, why don't I turn to Chris Rodriguez and, and Chief Conti. Hi Sam. Thanks for the question. Uh, so the original uh, release that was put out by the Secret Service, as you know, was very restrictive, uh, especially impacting uh, residents in the District of Columbia. Uh, when you look at the bridges that were within the D.C. Uh, footprint, uh, Sousa Bridge, uh, and 11th Street Bridge, South Capitol Street Bridge, all those bridges were impacted. So what we really tried to work out in an effort to make things more accessible for our D.C. residents is to at least uh, pare down those bridges to one single lane of traffic uh, coming in so that residents could traverse uh, across the city and still there's some impact there but we still have the ability to shut those bridges off if we need to so they're slowed down, but they're not closed. that's correct by 15th and Independence for firearms charges. It was a vehicle checkpoint. I understand DC police did not make those arrests, but can you talk about the perimeter, the, se the security perimeter, where you're seeing these arrests being made, and is this working the way that you all want it? Okay, so Stephanie is asking a question about two specific arrests um, and then the security perimeter in general. Thank you for the question, Stephanie. So the arrest was made uh, this morning. It was of a, uh, the United States Secret Service made the arrest. It was of a bus driver. Uh, so that, that, uh, that arrest was handled totally uh, by them. And then the perimeter as well, as you mentioned, uh, it's a huge perimeter, obviously. So there's MPD, federal law enforcement agencies, as well as uh, Secret Service manning those perimeters uh, throughout, our, throughout our city. And we're working collaboratively working collaboratively with them uh, to try to make sure that everything is, is, is continu continues to be safe for our residents and those that are involved in the inaugural festivities. That, sir. Can you can you kind of go over though, because there's two layers of perimeter here. And right. so for the folks who are seeing it saying, oh my God, this is happening so close. Can you just kind of describe like where these incidents are happening and how that's working to what you have all planned? Where the, I'm sorry, sorry. Where these incidents are happening, where these arrests yeah, are Yeah, so the arrests are, are taking place primarily at locations where there are checkpoints. Again, we're sweeping vehicles, we're checking vehicles. Uh, there are people who have to go through certain uh, security protocols in order to gain access uh, to the perimeter, to the inner perimeter. Uh, there's a green line that we talk about and a red line that we talk about. Uh, at those locations, they are encountering law enforcement personnel, and as a result of some of the interactions, we've made uh, we made a few arrests. Chief, what happens if the perimeters work and groups show up and can't make it in? and then they find themselves coming out into neighborhoods like this, the closest available soft targets would be neighborhoods that don't see any military presence and they're just left to MPD to protect. Thank you for that question, Mark. Uh, we, we've planned for that. Uh, we want to make sure that our communities are not forgotten uh, in our uh, security posture. Uh, so for every police district, you know, throughout all uh, eight wards in the city, uh, we have a, a contingency plan for that. We're fully staffed. Uh, members are working 12-hour shifts, and we have uh, we have sufficient resources to cover what we need to cover. Action and the mayor's reaction today. The Associated Press is reporting that two members of the National Guard have been removed from their security details here in the inauguration because they were found to have ties to uh, fringe militia groups. I'm just wondering what, if you know if it goes beyond those two members, if, there, if we should expect more members to have similar circumstances, and just what are your thoughts that now this vetting process has uncovered at least two members that they found problematic? 
Okay, uh, thank you for the question, Mark. So I am on, I'm only aware of those two members, and uh, just the very short answer to that, to that is that the vetting process obviously is working. To follow up on that, do you have confidence in the National Guard, Mayor Bowser, who are defending our city right now? We've called on the National Guard, Julie, as you know. The D.C. Uh, I won't go into my rant about the D.C. National Guard not really being the D.C. National Guard, but the President's Guard and all of that. Um, so, but maybe I will. So you know that the the district's guard. Um, it, it doesn't report to the mayor and council. The district's guard goes up through the army to the president of the United States. Um, so they are not accountable to us, which is part of uh, our, which is a big issue for us. Um, because when they are accountable to us, uh, we know about the leadership, we know about their, you know, completely know about their operations and we know that they answer to us uh, and not the president of the United States, whoever the president of the United States is. Um, and so when you have um, guards coming, guards, men and women coming from all over the country at this time, uh, I do think uh, that it is, is prudent uh, to make sure that, that they are being vetted uh, and that anybody who cannot pledge uh, allegiance to, um, to their mission, uh, and may be pulled by other views, needs not only to be removed from this duty, they need to be removed from the guard. Um, and can I ask, as you encourage everyone across the country to watch the inauguration from home tomorrow, can you tell us about your plans for how you're going to spend the day and watch the inauguration? I will be, um, I will be representing the district at the, on the podium, watching the next, or on the grounds. Actually, I don't know exactly where I'm going to be sitting, but I will be on the Capitol grounds. Yes, the question here, Mitch. Uh, yeah, I have a vaccine-related uh, question. Okay. Um, so the DC Health Director Nesbitt uh, was resisting allocating vaccine Can you uh, speak up, please? Uh, Dr. Nesbitt had resisted allocating vaccine doses by ward previously, but DC Health is now doing that. I guess I'm wondering what uh, changed in that calculation. Um, I don't, I'm not going to kind of agree with your characterization because I, I wasn't there for that whole conversation or any of the conversation actually. Um, but as you know, we implemented a, um, a early registration for wards that had been underrepresented in the vaccination registrations, but also over impacted by COVID. Um, and then a couple of days later, uh, opened up the reservation, the remaining reservations for the entire city. Uh, and let me just say, it's, it's pretty obvious that COVID has an uneven impact uh, in the district, both in terms of the incidence of COVID uh, and um, people who've died from COVID. And we're going to do everything that we can uh, to make sure that the people who need it most uh, have access to it. Um, but let, let's be real clear. Uh, we're talking about the release of 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, up to 8,000 appointments uh, when our need is, is much greater. So as long as we are working in this very intense period of scarcity over the vaccine, uh, we know that people who need and want the vaccine um, won't be able to get it. So almost every system uh, is imperfect until we have enough vaccine. Vaccine distribution along the lines of like who's most impacted as opposed to just opening the appointments up district wide? Well, that's been kind of the the strategy all along, like starting with healthcare workers, moving to people, um, elderly folks. Uh, we will have some subsets of essential workers, I think, that, that get rolled out next. Um, so that's always been the strategy of people who've been impacted most and whose types of work and jobs are critical to the COVID response in the functioning of, of society. Well, yeah. Uh, so MPD is investigating the Capitol police officer who uh, shot and killed a person in the Capitol a few weeks ago. Can you give us an update on that investigation and whether it will be made public when it's completed? 
Yeah, so the MPD will continue our investigation as we always do, as we always do for uh, law enforcement agencies that are involved in shootings. Uh, our findings will be uh, taken over to the United States Attorney's Office uh, for their consideration. And then once that's done, um, it comes back to us and then we'll uh, loop in Capitol Police for any administrative uh, issues uh, uh, to, that will follow that. No, obviously it's not completed. Uh, there's tons of video, there's tons of interviews that are underway, you know, as we go about this and, and it'll be a while. As you know, uh, police investigations, especially when you're talking about the loss of life involved, uh, we're very meticulous about, about those investigations. The investigations, uh, what goes over to the um, United States Attorney's Office, uh, once we turn it over and it becomes administrative matter uh, at that point, I think there's some public visibility there. Okay. Recently, I mean, yes. can you tell us when and can you tell us anything about that conversation? And um, generally, I can I can say to you, Mark, that um, I spoke to him after the events of January the sixth, uh, and um, we, we we spoke about a, a number of things related to the inauguration. Request for the seven hundred fifty million dollars DC was shorted in the uh, the stimulus pro plan. I, I answered you. We spoke. I'm not going to talk about the details of the conversation as I never do, but we spoke about a number of the things related to the inauguration. Uh, I, I can say that I don't think he would mind me saying this. Um, he said something to the effect like, kid, you know, I've always been there with you. You know, I've always supported statehood. <laughs> yes. Right, that's what he said. Elizabeth Elgorek, the Hill Rag. I have, I have a question first about vaccines uh, and then about security. First, Can you introduce yourself? Elizabeth Elgorek, the Hill Rag, the okay. very local Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> Hi. Uh, first My name's Elizabeth, too, so I'll remember that. First, a question about vaccines. How come we didn't create, how come the city didn't create a central registry? by phase and then contact patients to get the vaccine as opposed to having them call in in, in, a, in what amounts to for some people a, um, kind of a lottery well that would have been kind of a lottery too wouldn't it because until we have enough we ha there have to has to be some way to 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 pick people out Second question about uh, security. Do you have a sense of how long these security measures will be in place? And will you ask the federal government for compensation for the businesses that are forced to close due to these security well, measures? Well, we're, we're investigating that now, Elizabeth. That's a great question. Hers was two parts. Um, how long will we have these, um, these amped up security? Um, and if there's any relief for businesses who have been impacted. So we're looking into that now, uh, Deputy Mayor Fachikio and H. Sema. As you know, uh, I requested a pre-disaster declaration that was approved, uh, and we're investigating if there's any additional federal payments to businesses that can be made um, through that process. So we're starting that, and we will get back to you. Uh, today, I plan to talk to our Congresswoman um, and my team about uh, how we approach a, a new security posture in the district. Obviously, we don't want fences and armed troops uh, in our city any longer than they need to be. Um, but at the same time, we need to be smart about how we approach this new posture. So I've tasked DCH SEMA. Um, with doing some research for us. Unfortunately, we've had in our country um, other incidents of terrorism, both foreign and domestic, uh, and we want to look to see what have been the best approaches to hardening without looking like we're hardening um, our security. Yes. With uh, Telemundo, my question is for uh, Director Rodriguez. What's your name again? Alberto with Telemundo. Okay, Alberto. Um, my question is for uh, Director Go Rodriguez. Go ahead. Uh, we were just wondering if uh, are there is there any indication that there are threats to other buildings here in D.C. Obviously, the Capitol is fortified. 
Are there any threats, any indications of other buildings in the district? Thank you, Director. Let me repeat the questions. Are there any other specific threats to buildings outside of the federal enclave? Well, thanks for the question. And uh, along with the uh, Metropolitan Police Department and Chief Conti and his team, we have uh, daily uh, briefings with the FBI and the Secret Service. It was uh, something that Mayor Bowser requested after the 6th. Um, and at this time, we don't have any specific or credible threats to buildings or facilities outside of the federal enclave. One last round, and um, then I'll take some community questions, okay? Any press questions? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Mrs. Mayor and staff. My name is Lanita Avery. My concern, first of all, is to Chief Conti. Welcome. My concern is the uh, police officers yes, to be trained. Are they going to retrain them mentally and physically where they can handle situations and get back in shape? Also, the senior citizens, I'm very concerned about them as well as children. I Safety. All right. Thank you, Chief. That's a note that we need to focus on physical and mental health. Um, which the chief in all of this has reminded me, um, not just for our community, which is under a lot of anxiety due to COVID, but our police officers are as well. And he's very focused on how to make sure all of our police officers have access uh, to the help that they need um, and that they ask for that help. Okay, yes, Stephanie. If that is not completed in time, will those members be told to sit out or will they be allowed to work inauguration security? And then a follow-up question for events, DC. Sure. Okay. Um, so the, the first question was, if a person isn't vetted, will they be here or not? And Chris, I, I think you can speak to that process. And then, uh, Elliot, there's a question for you. Um, thanks for the question, Stephanie. So uh, a lot of the vetting and the background investigations that happen through the National Guard uh, occur when they become members. And so that vetting can take place uh, while they're in their home states uh, before before they deploy. And not speaking to specific investigations, is that those questions would have to be uh, referred to the National Guard and the FBI. Uh, but that's our understanding of the process. Okay, I think your question is what type of uh, circumstances are, am I up against in terms of promoting DC based on what the global community is seeing on the news? Um, I think the reality is that, you know, as a world class destination, we're not the first major city that has unfortunately had circumstances similar to what we're dealing with now. I think there are concerns from a global perspective and domestic perspective in terms of what they're seeing. And those, you know, those, those are, are, are rightfully uh, so concerns that these individuals might have about what's happening in Washington. I think we're looking at it through a long-term perspective. Um, and unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, you know, tur tourism to Washington has been um, has really been compromised already. So as we're looking at recovery um, from an international perspective, which is usually the audience that normally looks at something that's happening like right now and shows more concern about travel, uh, we'll have an opportunity to to rebound, if you will, simply because with the new administration, uh, with with uh, Chief Conti, with our mayor and and other others making safety and security a priority that will be extremely important as we're promoting DC as a destination um, you know the other reality too is that you're seeing similar things happen in other state capitals around the US 
which is a reason for concern. And those are the comments that we're getting from our offices. I think that um, this has happened in other global cities. So unfortunately, there is a precedent for this. The, the question is what happens next? And I think that's what we're going to be focusing on as we get back to normal in terms of uh, getting beyond the pandemic uh, and getting beyond what's happening in the city now with the inauguration. So we're extremely optimistic. Um, I also happen to chair the U.S. Travel Association. And in that capacity, we focus on safety, security, and other measures tied to travel to the U.S. on a regular basis. So th these are things in which we're focusing on right now. Okay, yeah. uh, do you anticipate ending the indoor dining uh, pause on January 22nd? So? I don't have anything to announce uh, about, about that uh, today, Mitch. Okay, uh, we'll take two more, Mark and then Elizabeth. I wonder if you have any information. We heard word about a body found near Fletcher's boathouse today. Do you have any any information on that? Yeah, it appears that the, it was a uh, homeless individual about 60 years of age, uh, possibly died of natural causes. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, that has to be investigated, but right now it does not appear any foul play or anything like that is, is involved. Water or was he on in the land in the woods or do you know anything yeah, about? I'm told that uh, he had an encampment near the water. True. Thank you very much. Any um, chief? The question was: Were any of the rioters charged with DC crimes? Local DC crimes? No, the majority of these folks that are being arrested are charged at the federal level, so they're in uh, they're in district court. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Isn't Ward Six beautiful?